Next item on special orders, uh, general orders number 138, Senate file 1060, Senator Newman. Madam President, thank you. Uh, Senate file 1060 is the Senate Omnibus Transportation Bill, uh, which I'm gonna go through in a, in, a, in a few minutes, but before I do, uh, there is some folks from the Transportation Committee that I would uh, uh, really like to, to thank for all of the help uh, that they have offered. Uh, I, I want to mention, uh, you know, all of the partisan and nonpartisan staff that have been so helpful during the course of putting this bill together. In particular, I want to mention uh, my CA, uh, David Larson, and my CLA, Evan Nelson, uh, for the help that they've given to me. Uh, Peter Mavis is our uh, partisan researcher who has been invaluable, but I also want to mention uh, the Senate uh, Council, Alexi Stengel, uh, and our uh, fiscal analyst, Krista Boyd, uh, who have uh, been very professional and very helpful throughout the course of this, and I uh, sincerely appreciate their help. The other folks that I, I do want to mention is the committee members. Uh, the members of this particular committee are a pretty interesting bunch, and I think we've had some, some fun. There's folks from the city, from the suburbs, and from the country. Uh, and uh, I just want you to know that I uh, have really enjoyed uh, getting to know you and work with you, and I, I in, uh, am very appreciative of your, of your insight and your comments during the course of our committee hearings. But in particular, I, I do want to mention Senator Dibble, the former chair uh, of the committee. Uh, Senator Dibble has been uh, very courteous to me, very helpful. He obviously is knowledgeable in the area of transportation. And uh, uh, we don't always agree on everything, but there are a lot of things that we do agree on. And I am looking forward to, uh, to uh, working with uh, Senator Dibble in the future and uh, together we will hopefully make some progress. In terms of the bill, uh, briefly what I want to do is I'm going to highlight the financial aspects of it, and uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, some of the more important uh, policy items that are in the bill. And uh, once I'm done with that, then uh, we'll open it up to discussion and amendments. First of all, uh, Madam President, to the fiscal aspects, uh, of the bill. This bill provides funding for the Department of Transportation, the Metropolitan Council, and the Department of Public Safety. The uh, general fund target for our committee was $400 million for the biennium and $500 million in the tails. The funding for these, uh, for these funds comes from redirecting sales taxes on auto parts, sales parts, rental vehicles, and lease sales taxes. Nearly all of the money uh, that uh, uh, is in this target flows into the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund, which is a constitutionally dedicated fund, and from there it flows into the Trunk Highway Fund, the County State Aid Highway Fund, the Municipal State Aid uh, Streets Fund, and uh, uh, with the additional money, uh, we have seen a significant increase in spending. Uh, we also have general fund, or most of the general fund spending that we have involves the uh, Metropolitan Council for Transit Operations. I will indicate that the Metropolitan Council for its Transit Operations uh, is fully fend, funded in this, uh, in this bill uh, at its base appropriations, plus they got a small uh, increase of about a million dollars. Overall, we are looking at uh, an increase uh, of 231 percent over the fiscal year 16-17 and 264 percent above the fiscal year 18-19. As to the uh, source of the funds that are involved in this bill, they are as follows. We're going to get $47 million from the leasing sales taxes. We're going to get $52 million 
from the rental car tax at the rate of 9.2 percent. We're going to get $37 million from the sales tax on rental cars, and that's at the rate of 6.5 percent. And the balance of our target, uh, uh, which equals $247 million, comes from the general sales tax on auto parts. Those revenues then flow into the following accounts in these rates. $343 million into the Trunk Highway Fund, $106 million into the County State Aid Highway Fund, $33 million into the Municipal Street Fund. We've got $9 million going into Town Roads and Bridges as part of the 5% set aside. We took out a one-time uh, funding source for small cities under 5,000 and allocated $10 million for them I will say that it's the only time, uh, the second time that I am aware of that that has occurred. A number of years ago, there was, I think it was $12.5 million set aside. So I'm, I'm uh, hoping that the small cities uh, will be pleased. The balance of the money then is $3.3 million going to Greater Minnesota Transit and an equal sum of $3.3 million going to the five-collar uh, five suburban counties. We are also increasing that funding by the sum of uh, $325 million in trunk highway bonds over the next four years, of which $200 million is going to go directly into the corridors of commerce, and $125 million will be designated for improvements to Highway 212, Highway 14, and Highway 12. In addition to those sums, we are uh, receiving $105 million uh, for fiscal year 17, and that is coming from the federal government in the form of FAST Act money. And in fiscal year 1819, which is the next biennium, we are going to get an additional $361 million from the federal government. Um, there are a few uh, policy uh, items in the bill that I want to mention specifically. Uh, there, are, there are quite a few policy items in there, but there's just a few that I want to mention. First of all, uh, Senator Bach has got a Clean Air Act settlement uh, money specifically appropriated by law that is in here. I think that's a particularly important piece of legislation because this is money that's coming to the state of Minnesota under the Volkswagen settlement. And what Senator Bach wanted to do is protect that sum so that the money that comes to the state of Minnesota is appropriated by law and not spent by a state agency without an appropriation. And uh, I do agree with and I thank Senator Bach for that legislation. There are two bills in here that are a, as a direct result of the uh, report from the Office of Legislative Auditor uh, from March of last year. The first one is Senator uh, Paul Anderson's uh, uh, Senate File 1524, and the other one is uh, Senate File 1525, that is Senator Jasinski's Jaczyn bill. Both of those bills uh, involve uh, direction, directing MnDOT in their project evaluation process uh, to make it uh, more accurate and more transparent. Senator Osmick had uh, uh, put in a bill, Senate File 355, uh, which is a bill that uh, requires uh, a study, uh, the purpose of which is to make MnDOT uh, more accountable and more transparent uh, in its uh, handling of its business. Senator Osmick also has Senate File 1769, which is a very controversial bill, but nevertheless an important one and it involves uh, the 50% uh, current operating costs that the state of Minnesota is required to pay uh, on all light rail. And what uh, Senator Osmick's bill does is we, the state of Minnesota remains on the hook to pay for the 50% of the operating costs for the current light rail systems that are running, but anything in the future uh, that uh, is built by any entity, uh, the state is not responsible for the operating costs unless the state is involved in the planning and construction of the light rail project, 
and specifically authorizes the operating costs. There's two bills in here that are, seem to be somewhat innocuous, but I really do like. Uh, one is Senator Chamberlain's bill that involves uh, uh, duplicate motor vehicle certificates of title uh, where that can be issued by the deputy registrars. The other is a, uh, a, a bill from Senator Lane uh, which authorizes the New Brighton driver's license uh, uh, agents to be full service driver's license offices uh, for the Commissioner of Public Safety. And the reason I mention them is that sometimes we lose track of our constituents and uh, these two bills uh, really do try to, to help the voters and the constituents uh, in the handling of their motor vehicles. Uh, and it, it was just kind of nice to see uh, a bill that would come along and do that. I really do like Senator Pratt's bill, which is a transfer on death of motor vehicles. Uh, over the years, I, I can't tell you how many folks came to me and, uh, after the death of a, of a loved one and they had to transfer the title to a motor vehicle and they didn't know how to do it. And Senator Pratt's bill uh, will help folks transfer the title of that motor vehicle and alleviate the, the need for uh, them to go to an attorney and have uh, pay an attorney uh, uh, fees and expenses. And so it's just one of those bills that I think is going to be very uh, helpful to people and I'm sure that they're going to appreciate it. Uh, Senator Anderson also had an, um, uh, an amendment that was added to the bill and that involved eminent domain. And this, this is an area that I, I frankly was kind of surprised to see but I was happy to take it. Uh, and it turns out that the Met Council, uh, by law, was not required to pay certain costs to landowners uh, when they went through eminent domain proceedings, whereas the, uh, for instance, MnDOT was. And that really didn't make a whole lot of sense to us. Uh, the, the type of costs that I'm talking about would be, uh, for instance, relocation fees. Uh, normally, when the government comes in and condemns land, uh, there are certain fees that they have to pay to the landowner, and it turns out Met Council was not obligated to do that. And so we are trying to correct that disparity in this bill. Members, that is the, uh, a brief run-through of the uh, various financial and uh, policy issues in the bill. Uh, Madam President, I do have one uh, technical amendment that I would like to offer uh, at this time, and that would be the uh, A88 amendment. Senator Newman offers the A88 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Newman moves to <laughs> amend Senate file number 1060 as follows, page 8, line 32, delete. This is the A88 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Newman. Madam President, uh, this is an amendment that was uh, suggested uh, by Mr. Nauman, the fiscal analyst in the uh, Finance Committee. Uh, in the bill, there are uh, a couple of places where it is indicated that appropriations are available until they are spent. Uh, that is uh, a phrase that uh, apparently causes some uh, concern and um, what was suggested by uh, the fiscal analyst and by uh, MnDOT is that we go with uh, at least some time period out in the future when the funds are going to uh, stop. In other words, the local units of government that are going to build the streets or the roads or whatever they're going to use this money for, uh, there has to be an end date. And so we pushed it out to June 30th, 2027. Uh, in order to accommodate the recommendation of the fiscal uh, analyst, and that is the purpose of the uh, A88 amendment. Further discussion on the A88? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The amendment is adopted. Senator Newman. Madam President, uh, that concludes uh, the opening remarks that I have on uh, Senate file. Uh, 1060, and uh, uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, 
Well, Madam President, uh, why don't I uh, uh, frame my opening comments uh, by offering the A, uh, A70 amendment. Senator Dibble offers the A70 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Dibble moves to amend Senate File Number 1060 as follows, page 5, line 30, delete. This is the A70 amendment. Discussion to the amendment, Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Madam President uh, and members, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Newman. Oh, hang on, let me grab my amendment so it can be distributed. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam President and members. Um, uh, Senator Newman, um, uh, let me echo um, your, your compliments. Uh, I think uh, I speak for my members. We enjoy uh, serving on your committee, um, and I enjoy the, uh, the vigorous debate uh, that, we, that we do have, um, enjoy when we agree, uh, and, I, and I enjoy when we, when we disagree. Um, Madam President and members, uh, much has been said about transportation. Um, all over the state, in this chamber, in the other body, in the executive branch. Um, I think every year we've made a, a good run at, uh, at passing a transportation bill pretty much uh, every year that I've been here. Um, and uh, Madam President and members, we um, uh, I think have uh, established uh, fairly, fairly well without a, a lot of debate the um, the need that we have, and, and, the, and the reason of the, you know, the need as it's articulated uh, in terms of just, uh, just numbers, uh, Madam President. We know that um, Minnesota's roads and bridges are in extremely poor shape. Um, we use some of the material that's been generated by the executive branch and, uh, and the governor. Uh, more than half of Minnesota roads are more than 50 years old. 40% of the state's bridges are more than 40 years old in the next three years. One in five Minnesota roads will pass their useful life, making it increasingly difficult for Minnesota businesses to move their goods to market, for Minnesotans to commute. Uh, Madam President, we know that uh, transportation is fundamental infrastructure. Um, it allows people to get to where they need to go to do what they need to do. Uh, we know that in the next uh, 10 to 15 years, we're going to be uh, growing by about 40 to 50,000 new residents per year. And um, that means that we're going to add up to 800,000 residents um, in the foreseeable future. And um, Madam President, our roads simply cannot uh, withstand that kind of new pressure. We need a multimodal transportation system. Uh, we need to not just repair uh, what we do have, um, but make sure that we're getting ready for, for that new population uh, as well, the business community. Um, when I was chairing the transportation Committee. We went around uh, to many, many communities in the business community, uh, local units of government, residents, uh, people re represent seniors, uh, people re represent kids, people represent academic institutions, all said the same thing. We need uh, to improve what we have and we need to uh, uh, fix what we have and, and make some improvements in key places. So, Madam President, the uh, A70 um, is a modest proposal. It's a five cent uh, per gallon uh, gas tax increase, uh, and um, we know that uh, the, uh, and it eliminates the, the general fund uh, uh, transfer uh, into transportation purposes um, because we want to get away from uh, competing uh, for the general fund resources that are, are so important in terms of taking care of our young people in the schools and our seniors and in their health care needs and uh, making sure that we're we have that essential state partnership in the form of the lo local government aid, uh, and those sorts of very important priorities we have in the general fund, um, and really make the kind of investment that has the return, that's sustainable for the future, that's constitutionally dedicated, um, and uh, is, is fairly modest uh, in its approach. Uh, Madam President, coming around to uh, everyone's desk is, uh, is a map um, that shows where Minnesota is at present uh, with the the gas tax rate that it, it imposes on a per gallon basis. Um, and you can see that map shows us at 28.6 cents. Um, that's, you know, the 25 cents that has been around since before 2008 and the three, three and a half cents or so um, that funded the chapter 152 uh, bridge improvements uh, as, as well. Uh, surrounding us, the only uh, 
state that uh, is slightly lower than us is North Dakota. And on a national basis, we're right in the middle of the pack uh, at, at 26th highest. Um, so, uh, Madam President, the, uh, the Transportation Finance Advisory Committee uh, that, that turned in its numbers uh, about uh, four years ago now, almost five years ago, um, told us that just to fix the state highway system that we have at present, just to maintain current levels of performance, we need $250 million more dollars per year. The gas tax, of course, loses ground to inflation. Uh, it loses ground to uh, energy efficiency. It loses ground to the fact that um, young people and older people just simply don't drive as much as they used to. If the gas tax had been allowed to uh, increase at the rate of inflation, uh, just regular inflation, uh, since the small increase, since prior to the small increase in 2008, so going back to 1988, um, it would just, it would be at 40.1 cents per gallon. If it had been allowed to increase and, and, and maintain its purchasing power relative to construction inflation, it'd be at almost 60 cents uh, per gallon. Uh, I'm looking at this handout uh, that's, that's on your desk um, from the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. There's a couple of other uh, of, uh, numbers to which uh, the gas tax is pegged. Um, if it had been allowed to increase at the same rate that uh, transit fares have increased since that time in 1988, transit fares, by the way, have increased, been increased 10 times in that period of time, the gas tax only once, and that was that small increase uh, in 2008, it'd be at uh, 58.3 cents. Um, peak transit fares have even outpaced the base transit fare, uh, and that would be at 70.6 cents. Um, uh, Madam President, uh, Senator Newman's bill um, only increases on, a, on an annual basis uh, through the formula in the Trunk Highway and the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund, uh, putting a little over $225.8 million from those general fund uh, uh, resources um, uh, only to the tune of 112.9, far short of what we need just to maintain what we have, so we're not this bill doesn't even keep up with what we need for our, for our state highway system. We know, of course, that 90% of the miles in our state are owned and operated by local units of government. We have the county state aid highway system as well as the county roads and municipal state aid uh, system as well as municipal roads and, of course, township roads, of which there are uh, many, many. Uh, and uh, we know that the, uh, those also have uh, extreme pressure. Just to keep up with what we need there is something along, on the orders of 50 uh, to $150 million just to maintain what we have in the, in the part of the system, the subset of the system that's supported by the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund, the gas tax, motor vehicle, motor vehicle sales tax, and uh, license tab fees, much less the $450 million or so that we need uh, to keep up um, with the uh, increasing pressure that we're going to have from our growing economy and our increased population. Um, so, Madam President, this is just a modest proposal, five cents per gallon, um, doesn't uh, transfer, divert money from the general fund. It raises money in kind of an open, uh, honest way, in a constitutionally dedicated fashion so that it can be relied upon uh, on into the future. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, Madam President. Thank you, uh, Senator Dibble, for opening up the subject for increasing the fuel taxes. Uh, in Dakota County, we've, we have uh, the county commissioner and legislator meetings several times a year, and they give us their priorities. And the last time we did get their priorities, uh, we got their top three. And the top three were transportation funding, transportation funding, and transportation funding. And I think that uh, that echoes what we've been hearing for the last several years, even uh, uh, in 2015 when we did a tour around the state and we heard many of the locals telling us that they need more transportation funding for not only their local state aid highways, but also through their main streets, the uh, state roads that go through their, uh, their towns, through the middle. And uh, uh, so they've been asking for more and more funding. Last year, in 2016, uh, transportation funding was said to be the number one legislative priority. Unfortunately, we did not get it done. I did collect some letters that were from uh, various groups 
and asking for more transportation funding. And some of these were in, uh, uh, they were CEOs that wrote in the Minneapolis paper, they were uh, mayors, metro mayors, and then we've gotten some from the Chamber of Commerce and the Association of Minnesota Counties. And I'd like to just read some excerpts of that. From the mayors, 12 major, I'm sorry, this is from the CEOs. 12 major CEOs say Minnesota businesses need transit and we need it now. As CEOs of Twin Cities' major employers, we ask legislators to seize this opportunity. This was written by Richard Davis and Scott Wine, Richard Davis from uh, uh, U.S. Bank, Scott Wine, and uh, Doug Baker from Ecolab. Uh, and this was printed in the Minneapolis Star Tribune, May 6, 2016. And what they said is, we are therefore calling on the state legislature to make a comprehensive investment in our overall infrastructure by passing a bipartisan transportation funding bill this year. To us, comprehensive means money for roads, bridges, and transit. The business community cannot afford to miss out on this investment. Neither can the health of our communities, our region, or the state of Minnesota. We hope state lawmakers will take action to ensure the best future of our region. Uh, I have 45 Ch Minnesota Chambers of Commerce. In their letter, they said, we strongly support sustained increased investment in our roads, bridges, and transit systems. I have uh, the names of 14 undersigned Metro mayors that say, invest in all more modes, fund state transportation fully, and do it now. The excerpt quote is, as mayors of communities in the Twin Cities metro area, we know firsthand how important well-functioning transportation systems are to our residences and residents and businesses. An effective, multi efficient, multimodal transportation system is critical not only to improving the mobility, but also to advancing local economies, providing access to opportunity and enhancing the quality of life in the metro and in greater Minnesota alike. It's time for smart investments in all modes. It's time to get the job done. Then I have the signatures of 144 county commissioners across Minnesota from the Association of Minnesota Counties. I won't read them all. But what they say is to address these needs, the Association of Minnesota Counties, CAMC, supports new revenue for transportation. Specifically, we're in favor of comprehensive transportation of a comprehensive transportation financing package that provides funding for roads, bridges, and transit services. It should also be balanced among regions of the state and modes of transportation. Members, this is pent up demand and we're not getting it done. And with that, we have, uh, we're below average in fuel taxes in Minnesota right now. And so I'm offering an amendment to Senator Dibble's amendment, and this is the A-72 amendment. Senator Carlson has offered the A-72 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Carlson moves to amend the Dibble amendment to Senate file number 1060 as follows. Page one, delete lines two to seven. This is the A-72 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Madam President. To the amendment, 15 cents a gallon. Now that sounds like a big number, but it's not really. We, and I think uh, Senator Dibble told you that it would be even higher than that if we had followed inflation. The problem is, is that our road costs have increased greater than inflation. So what we're, we're falling behind, we've fallen behind before, this is a per gallon, fixed price that you pay in fuel taxes. And so it can't just automatically increase as inflation increases. So we have to address it. And we have attempted to, we have attempted to, and we have attempted to. And it's, it's painful to increase a tax. But the problem is it's also painful to drive on poor roads. Uh, I was telling, I believe it was Senator 
Senjum a couple of days ago that I would, I would favor an in, a, uh, increase in this tax just to fix Cedar Street as I go home every night because as you go down past the judicial center, it is really rough. And so we have a lot of streets and roads that need to have that kind of attention. They're falling apart, there's holes in them, there's potholes, there's uh, under capacity, lots of things that need to be done. Now when we're talking about 15 cents a gallon, I hope you can sharpen your pencil and take a, take a look at what that would cost you. It's not as much as you think. Most of us drive somewhere around 15,000 miles a year. For the people in this chamber, I would suspect we drive a bit more because we have a greater Minnesota people. And let's just say 20,000 miles per year. That's a, that's a thousand gallons at 20 miles to the gallon. A lot of cars now are better than that. A few are worse. I own a few of them. But the fact is, that's a thousand gallons a year. A thousand gallons times 15 cents is 150 bucks. That's not very much. That's $12.50 a month. $12.50 a month to help catch up on this pent-up demand. So members, I'm hoping that I can get your, uh, your support for putting the purest user fee that we have in Minnesota into more roads and bridges. It's constitutionally dedicated, so it can't be stolen out like diverting other funds. This is a very good tax for us to be able to fund our roads. Thank you. Senator Newman. Madam President, uh, I would impose a call to the Senate for the purposes of the uh, amendment to the amendment. The Senate is under call. Madam President. Senator Newman. I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and the sergeant at arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. On that motion, all in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The motion is adopted. We have before us the A72. Senator Newman. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I would request a roll call on the amendment to the amendment. Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted to the amendment, Senator Newman. Madam President, um, what's being done here, obviously, is, is uh, just um, uh, two different amendments. We're on the amendment to the amendment uh, for an increase in the gas tax in the state of Minnesota. Very, uh, strikes me as being, uh, you know, very straightforward. Uh, I think uh, for purposes of uh, our colleagues, uh, if you just, for the most part, look at line 1.17 on the amendment to the amendment, and there's the gas tax increase that we, for the most part, are really dealing with. Uh, members, I, I will tell you that I, uh, I oppose uh, the amendment. Um, uh, I uh, am not in favor of raising the gas tax at this point. I know that there are many, many of my colleagues that are not. I am not aware of any appetite in the other body to raise the gas tax. And at least from my standpoint, here's the reason. I don't look at the Minnesota budget as being a silo of money for education and a silo of money for transportation and a silo of money for health and human services. The way I look at our budget, overall is that we have a fixed number of citizens who are out there working every day and paying taxes to the government and it comes in and then we figure out what silo to put it into. But if we add up 
all of the general appropriations for the state of Minnesota, and we add to that all of the money that we get from the federal government, and we add to that all of the real estate taxes that our folks pay, and we add to that all of the taxes like the gas tax and the fees, if we add up all of that money, I think that we are currently at about $80 billion for the biennium for five and a half million citizens. And I think that there is a limited amount of money that we can forcibly extract out of our citizenry before the roles get reversed and we wind up working for the government. And I think we're perilously close. So I, I am going to oppose uh, the uh, gas tax increase that is before you right now. I can tell you for the very same reason, if you, if you throw a, a, uh, a, an amendment at me that uh, you want to change the rate of payment on license tab fees or adjust the uh, amortization rate on payment of those fees, I'm going to oppose it. And I simply believe that there is enough money in the system right now that if we make our government run more efficiently, that we will be able to very easily pay for the transportation needs that we have. And without question, I agree that we have a great deal of needs when it comes to transportation. We have great needs when it comes to transit. But to simply try and find an answer of simply go back to the people and take more money out of their pocket as an answer seems to me to be very unimaginative. And so I, I am not going to agree to this gas tax increase, and I'm going to ask that the members of this body uh, vote it down for the reasons that I have stated, and I'm going to ask that the members of this body vote down what probably will be future requests coming on this, bond, or on this uh, transportation bill here on the uh, Senate floor this afternoon. So with, with that, uh, uh, members, you know, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit sobering. All of a sudden, we're sitting here talking about these gas taxes, and there is, there's arguments that can be, can be made, but the final thought that I will give you is that when it comes to a gas tax, uh, candidly, I think the gas tax is as out of date as the general formula for education. Things have really changed since the gas tax was imposed. Cars are more efficient. Transportation, or I should say transit, mass transit, is, is used a lot more than it used to be, and so cars are coming off the road. Um, we now have electric cars. I think I saw an advertisement the other day that an electric car is going to run for, for like thirty dollars to $40,000. All of a sudden, they're very efficient, and we don't tax them, and they use the highways even though the Constitution says any substance that propels a motor vehicle is eligible to be taxed for purposes of a gas tax. So I would really like to be a little more imaginative when it comes to raising the money necessary to pay for the transit and the transportation needs of the state of Minnesota, and I simply do not believe that this is the way to do it. Madam President. Senator Friends. Thank you again, Madam President, and thank you, members. Um, I rise to the simple question of the people of Minnesota and what they do and what they do not want and what silos they will and will not support us taking it out of. I'm a proud member of the Senate Transportation Committee, and I enjoy serving with you, Senator Newman, and you know I do. But I'm a no on this bill for some basic reasons. First, it does not fully fund transportation to the amount that both parties seem to agree is necessary. Second, and maybe more to the point, it raids the general fund where we pay for things like health care and education and the things Minnesotans want and need. Therefore, I support an amendment that seeks to raise the gas tax. And I ask this body the simple question, if we're here to represent the people, then how much do we listen to what the people are telling us about this topic? Members, you have in front of you handouts 
that represent a large swath of Minnesota supporting a gas tax, including the Minnesota pork producers, Minnesota soybean growers, Minnesota corn growers. I've provided the survey of the Highway 14 partnership showing overwhelming support for the use of a gas tax as a way to fund our roads. Members, I represent uh, part of Blue Earth County and all of Nicollet County. Taking those groups as a whole, that's practically everybody in my district. And if these groups are willing to put pen to paper and ask for us to consider, nay, they're willing to put their names behind a, r a rise in the gas tax, a modest rise at that, I would ask, aren't those the people we're working for? Isn't that what we're supposed to be here doing? I'd also point out the gas tax allows us to capture revenue from people from other states that drive on our roads. I don't know why this isn't more of a feature of this discussion. We pay gas taxes up to 50 cents a gallon when we travel to other states to help them with their roads, but for some reason we're reluctant to ask those from other states when they come here to bear the same burden. States that increased the gas tax just in 2015 include the state of Michigan, Georgia, Idaho, Nebraska, Utah, and Washington. And those are just the ones I was able to find as I looked. So we're simply saying, what is the smartest way for us to budget? And I'll just offer this moment in our, in our week, as I listened to the Health and Human Services bill be debated in finance, I repeatedly heard, we won't be able to fund this. Our target doesn't allow this. We wish we could do this. And I ask you, members, if that's not a sign that we're raiding the general fund to the extent that it's harming Minnesotans and doing the things we don't want, then I don't know what is. I would urge members to consider the amendment, and I appreciate the time very much, Madam President. To the amendment, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam President. Would Senator Carlson yield for a question? Senator Carlson will yield. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so the, the amendment, I understand, is for 15 cents a gallon. Is that correct? And, and I'm wondering, um, could you, you told us, uh, um, I think, quite clearly what if it would be for 20,000 miles a year. But can you tell Minnesotans overall what this total tax will cost uh, the whole state of Minnesota? What kind of an increase that the state of Minnesota will see with a 15 cents a gallon gas tax? Senator Carlson. Yeah, thank you, Madam President and Senator Ingebrigtsen. Generally, we use a rule of thumb of about $30 million collected per penny of gas tax increase. So you can do the math which, with whatever size increase you would like. And you always have to remember that that is totally 100% dedicated to roads and bridges. No, no one else can come in there and fish out any other money. So thank you for the question. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam, Pres Ma Madam President. Would uh, Senator yield for one more question? Senator Carlson will yield. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Uh, we've all been uh, going at this a little bit too long in the last two days, and I can't put it in my mind exactly what that computes out to be. Uh, do, would you happen to know what that turns out to be, 15 cents a gallon? Senator Carlson. Madam President, Senator Ingebrigtsen, that's about $450 million. Uh, what we've said is that we need at least $600 million just to stay even. Thank, thank you, Madam President. Members, uh, that's $450 million per year then. Is that correct? Senator Carlson. M Madam, Madam President and Senator Ingebrigtsen, yes, that's the number. Thank you. Thank, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam President. And I'll just finish with a comment. Uh, so about, about $800 million for the biennium. Uh, members, I... I have to stand uh, uh, and oppose this. Uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago, folks, that we raised $2.1 billion taxes on the state of Minnesota. And uh, I guess there's a case to be made. That's probably why we're sitting with a surplus. And I know that's been brought up many times uh, on the floor as well as in the committee that we're enjoying this uh, tremendous uh, uh, amount of money that we have in the bank. And uh, let's not forget where we got that money or whose money that is and how we got there. So I just don't think, uh, I don't think Minnesota's can handle too much more of this. And I think Senator Newman's right. I think it's right close to the breaking point. And uh, uh, even the governor last year was talking about a reduction in taxes. In fact, he was, I believe, willing to sign on to the uh, tax bill. Uh, 
but uh, for some reason decided to pocket veto it over one word, but nevertheless, it doesn't matter. Uh, he himself even realized that uh, the burden's becoming too, too tough for Minnesotans, so members, I would, I would vote no on the uh, 15 cents a gallon gas tax. Senator Dibble. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam President. Um, well, I think uh, Senator Carlson improved on the work that I started, and I thank him for offering the amendment uh, to my amendment. Uh, members, I, um, I talked earlier about uh, the need. Um, there is, there's a handout you can refer to it. It's the uh, Transportation Finance uh, Advisory Committee handout. It's got the Scenario 1, Scenario 2, and Scenario 3 columns, and it, and it shows um, uh, what our annual funding gap is for Scenario 2 just to maintain the baseline to maintain current performance for the next 20 years is $250 million. Um, and Madam President, in a moment I'll share that that's not a fictional made up uh, amount plucked out of the air. Um, and if you look at Scenario 3, uh, the baseline that we would need to become economically competitive, um, and that's the, uh, the 500 to 600 million dollar annual funding gap for the next uh, 20 years. And uh, Senator Carlson's um, proposal doesn't even get us there. It gets us to 400 and some. And I'll just remind you again that um, this would simply uh, allow the gas tax to reclaim its purchasing power that it had uh, 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 a couple of decades ago. Um, and we'll also remind you that um, you know this will put us kind of uh, um, you know, in an economically competitive place relative to um, the states that surround us as well as the, the rest of the country. Uh, Madam President, in 2016, 3.5% of our pavement roadway miles were in poor condition. Um, this is going to increase um, by over double uh, in, the next, uh, in the next biennium. Uh, once a two-lane road is at the end of its remaining service life, the cost for uh, simple fixes is $500,000 per mile of roadway. Total reconstruction, which is what we're going to be looking at at many, many of our roads if we don't get ahead of the game, and this bill doesn't even get close to even putting us in the game, um, uh, would be $3 million to $4.2 million per mile. Adding a lane or converting a two-lane to four-lane um, is roughly the same as reconstruction. Again, that $3 million. In urban area, that's $4.21 million per mile. In the metro area, of course, the additional traffic, the bridges, the ramps, et cetera, um, cause everything to be much, much more expensive. We'll have that conversation in a second, why it's smarter to do transit in the metro than build a whole bunch of roadway capacity. Um, Madam President, we also have a lot of bridges, and bridges are, by their very nature, uh, extremely expensive. Uh, and we know from recent experience, uh, we've done some uh, significant bridge projects. The state owns, uh, uh, in the next 10 years, anticipates uh, 1,000 bridges will, will be in need of some type of repair over the next 10 years. Uh, and we know that uh, the bridges that we, the major bridges we fixed up in Duluth, uh, well over $200 million, the Highway 53 bridge um, that we're doing up in Senator Thomasoni's. Uh, neck of the woods is about $240 million, the Dresbach Bridge, $212.8 million, um, the Cayuga Bridge, um, $170.7 million. Uh, Madam President, um, these, are, these are real dollars, um, and this is uh, an expensive proposition, but we know we have a return on those dollars because um, if we don't actually pay for what we need in a proactive fashion, I like to use the metaphor good debt and bad debt. We invest in our economy or we pay out of our back pocket and we simply bleed money and we lose money. We pay in other ways. So when we talk about asking our, our uh, constituents to pay, we don't get away from asking our constituents to pay because they pay in, in a number of different ways from lack of, op of economic opportunity, uh, our businesses pay because they are stuck in congestion, they, Employees can't get to them. They can't get their goods to market. We pay when we delay those fixes and they become more and more expensive. We pay uh, in, in terms of poor environmental outcome. 
We pay when people's cars have to be repaired because they're hitting pothole after pothole. Uh, we pay in poor public health outcomes because of carbon emissions and pollution and the consumption of natural resources and water resources. We pay when we have to force families to buy the extra car, the second car, the third car. The average household expense is, is $10,000 uh, per year. So, Madam President, we don't get away from paying. It's just, are we going to pay in a way that provides a return on that investment? Or are we simply going to kick, put off cost to a future point? Are we going to lose economic opportunity? Are we going to pay for fixes that become just more and more expensive? Transportation challenges don't go away. They don't disappear. We can't close our eyes to them. And I appreciate and I believe and I respect Senator Newman and I respect those, respect those who don't want to, to do this, who believe that there's enough money in the system. But if that's true, then why haven't we put that money in our bill? I mean, I disagree with this source. I think diverting from the general fund, competing with education, competing with health care, competing with property tax relief is, is wrong-headed. But if you believe that is a proper use of general fund money, then why didn't we put enough to even do the bare minimum and maintain our system as it is? Why didn't we do enough to actually get ready for the coming population and the emerging economy to put our state on a competitive footing with all of the states in this country and the states surrounding us? So, Madam President, I think this is a good proposal. Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Madam President. Um, uh, picking up on what Senator Dibble just said, constituents paid. Our constituents have paid. The state of Minnesota, the Minnesotans in the state have paid dearly and a lot. It's been mentioned here about the tax increase in the last few years, in the last 20 years, what has gone up and what has not gone down. So they have paid, they have paid dearly. And the, uh, these roads have been ignored. The infrastructure system has been ignored. Not on my watch, previous watches, under certain plans. Mass transit at the cost of roads and the bridge repair, even if you don't expand capacity. So the constituents have paid. And as far as um, uh, money and competitiveness and taxes, this state, this state, Madam President and members, we are in the top 10 or 5 in almost every category of tax you can imagine. And as I've said before, except wireless taxes. So that little cell phone everybody's looking at, you're pretty lucky. We're, we're right in the middle. But every category of taxes, and then including uh, combined tax burden in this state, we're in the top 5, have been for years. So there are members here that say, so what? Go back to the constituents and let's shake them down some more. I find that personally, you no, know, well, it's very hard to take because nobody, in, most people in my district, members, have not been telling me to raise taxes. I'm not sitting back here in the back corner at this desk because I campaigned on raising taxes and spending gobs more money. I'm not here because that's what I campaigned on. I promise you, I did not utter that word, those phrases, once during the campaign season. So I'm not here because I, my constituents wanted taxes. So if somebody wants taxes, some more fine, but mine certainly don't. The state is in a bad way when it comes to taxes. And I think we have a little more respect for the citizens of this state before we start going around saying, oh, let's just go grab another 450 million, a billion dollars every year from them. When we talk about needs, I agree with Senator Newman. We have to start thinking about this in a new way. We need to think about how we do things in this state in a brand new way. Talk about needs, we're just sitting here talking about taxes, it, about, about roads. It's easy for members to get up and say, we need another 500 million a year, 600 million a year. Well, the last couple of days alone, we need another maybe billion a year just to take care of our water systems because all these small towns are going to be forced to uh, up, upgrade their uh, pollution control systems. K-12, we never hear enough about that. <coughs> Governor wants universal pre-K. Okay, there's another half a billion or a billion. Roads, we're talking about that today. Mental health, do we have the money for mental health? Where are we going to do that? Are we going to go back and shake down the citizens some more? If they even stay in the state, Keep doing this to them, and they're leaving the state. And by the way, the data says they are. 
Oh, and not to mention our senior citizens and the baby boomers who can be retired, and we have to manage that and, and make sure they're taken care of. So before we just casually go around and think it's fun and neat to take another half a billion or a billion from Minnesotans, because they can, they can do it, and we're the politicians and we're the bureaucrats and we can do it, have a little respect. And let's, let's take Senator Newman's approach. Let's take the approach and say, there's other ways to do this. We can be more creative, innovative, and forward thinking about how we do this. Because believe me, there is not enough money in this state to continue to do what we're doing. So innovation, creation, creativity, new ideas. Be careful where we want to go to taxes. Uh, oppose the amendment, of course. Thank you. Senator Claussen. Well, thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm kind of a data person looking at data and we're just listening to Senator Chamberlain. He talked about think of it in a new way. Look about creativity. Well, let's look at some data for creativity. Minnesota is the 12th largest geographic state. We have the 21st largest population. We've got the third largest road system. Do you see a problem? So let's think creativity. What road should we be shut down? How about uh, Senator Sengem? How about Highway 52 going down to Rochester? That would be saving us some money. Or Highway 61 going up to Duluth. We can phase out roads as uh, they need to be repaired. Let's not repair them. Let's just put up barricades and we'll shut them down. There's a reason why it costs money and why we're behind in our road system. Third largest road system in the U.S., 12th largest state, 21st largest population. Do the math, figure it out. There's a reason why we're in the situation we are. And I think we do need to think about creativity. We need to think about our road system in a new way, but the biggest thing we need is more revenue if we're going to continue to move ahead and provide the transportation systems that our commerce requires in this state. So think about the data. Look at the data. It kind of uh, gives you some conclusions. And members, just a gentle reminder that you need to address the president. I know everybody's tired and it's hard to remember all the rules when you're tired, but just I've seen it a few times today and just appreciate if they'd remember. Senator Ralph. Thank you, Madam Chair. The other day in committee, we were listening to a young mother who was talking about the fact that we were going to raise some assistance in a program in human services. And it was noted that the increase hadn't been made for almost 20 years, and we were giving them $13. And everybody thought that, oh, wow, that doesn't sound like much. That's, that's horrible. That's nothing. And this mother stood up and said, $13 to me means diapers, means food, means gasoline to put in my car. And now we're asking that young mother to give up $15 a month or more because she probably doesn't drive a car that gets 20 miles to the gallon. And if she drives 20,000 miles, maybe it's $20 a month. So I think we have to stop and think about the tax burdens that we put on our citizens. I agree, we have enough revenue. We've looked at the numbers. We have a huge amount of money we're talking $42 billion in our budget, or more. Somewhere within that, we should be able to find funds to be able to accomplish the things that government should do. We should look closely at where we spend our money. I am definitely opposed to this regressive tax because it will hurt lower income people. 
I'm also opposed to it because it will grow government. We need to get control of the runaway spending, and adding more taxes is not the way to do that. I would vote against this amendment. Thank you. Senator Friends. Thank you again, Madam President. Uh, members, I rise just to say to Senator Chamberlain how much I agree that this is entirely about respect and the job we do and the way we represent the people of Minnesota says a lot about whether we do or do not respect them. I live in Nicollet County, which is the third largest pork producing county in the state of Minnesota, an industry that's almost $3 billion, and I'm standing in front of a letter from them saying, please raise the gas tax. So if I'm respecting those gentlemen and ladies that work in the pork production industry, and I get a letter from them saying we support raising the gas tax, and I say we did not, I'm not sure that shows the kind of respect that I'm looking for. The rest of Nicollet County almost entirely is corn and soybean, and of course I have letters from them too saying we support a rise in the gas tax. And I ask members, when people take the time to put pen to paper and go public with a request to raise the gas tax, where is the issue of respect? Where is the issue of listening to the people that we represent? And I urge members to consider that as they vote this issue. As far as the budget, we all know what we're looking for is the optimum budget for the state of Minnesota. And as I review the transportation bill, which I worked alongside Senator Newman and my fellow committee members and enjoyed every minute of it, and they know it, what I see is a huge cut in the general fund. And I ask myself for those people that Senator Ralph is concerned about, how does that cut in the general fund affect them? and is the gas tax the best way to serve the people of Minnesota? This is a state where we have a surplus, suggesting that for the moment, our budget is in balance. Thank you very much, Madam President. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I also have enjoyed being on the Transportation Committee. It's been uh, fun to be Vice Chair, and Senator Newman has been, sorry, Senator Newman uh, has been the, uh, presenting, so I've got to chair the meeting several times, so I've enjoyed that. Uh, I rise in opposition against gas tax increase. Uh, the reason I do is it, it really, you know, Senator Carlson made the comment about the typical residential person who affects them about $200 a year. Uh, but how about the industry and the construction and, and everything that goes on in the commerce? That all increases the price. So if the average truck driver has to increase, the, or the truck, trucking company has to increase their costs of moving food, or the school districts have to pay more for their school bus traffic because they're paying more tax on their, or more taxes, or construction, or snowmobiles, or boating, all these things are, are uh, areas that we see in Minnesota spending money. It, it increases everything, so the price of everything goes up. I've been working with Senator Frentz as well across the aisle to try and get Highway 14 done. That's our big thing here. And that was the biggest thing that I heard when I was going door to door in my district was Highway 14 and no new gas tax. And I appreciate the, the look at, at gas tax and I'm just gonna make a, uh, a quote off the US uh, Highway 14 partnership comment here in a comment that says, this survey shows that there is strong support for raising the gas tax and allowing the Metro to fund its own light rail. And here's the quote if it means we get Highway 14 done. So of course, if you tell me we get Highway 14 done in, in the district, in Highway 14, they're gonna say, yeah, increase the gas tax. But if you re rephrase that and say, just increase the gas tax without keeping 14 in, I think the cha it changes the percentage of what people say of increasing a gas tax. I go along with uh, Senator Newman of capturing and also with uh, Senator Fishbach and changing the auto parts sales tax from uh, coming and, and contributing towards that. Yes, it does create a hole in our general fund, but we need to prioritize where we spend it. And I think it is the, the government's role is to fund uh, our roads and bridges. So I think it's most important to not to increase these taxes. I deal with businesses and industries every day in my real world, uh, why they come to Minnesota and what their frustrations are, and it is the high taxes. And that doesn't happen right away. You don't see a mass exit out of Minnesota right away or immediately when you raise these things, but over time they look at everything else and what's going on and the increased costs in Minnesota versus other areas where they could go. I've seen industries leave Minnesota because they're going somewhere where the tax advantages are better. So I've seen it personally in my other business. Um, I want to continue to work towards a, a program that, that does bring transportation and an overall system from transit to, to rail to uh, all the things that we need here in Minnesota, but I don't believe a gas tax is the way we want to go. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Osmick. 
Well, thank you, Madam President. And let me first comment that uh, you, you certainly find out when your freshmen are catching on, when they're stealing your arguments before you could stand up. Um, Senator Ralph is exactly correct. This is the most regressive tax you can possibly think of. And Senator Jasinski is exactly correct when he says, and let's be more blunt about it, this will cause inflation. Inflation at the local cafe. Inflation at the grocery store. Inflation of prices across the board because almost everything, unless we think we can carry this goods and services to market on light rail, this is gonna cause inflation. And it's gonna hurt you when you buy goods and services. But that's not why I stood up. I just want to correct maybe a myth. I just want to talk about what MnDOT says. And I brought this up in committee, and I appreciate the comments from the folks in the front of the, of the room. I really do, that they want more money. I want more money. Love to spend more money on roads and bridges. But the fact of the matter is, and when, you, when people say, raise the gas tax, Great idea, great sound bite. Then you say to them, but did you know from fiscal 16 to the end of fiscal 21, our highway user distribution fund, this is the fund that funds roads and bridges, the highway user distribution fund. This is MnDOT talking. This isn't some partisan group coming up with it. This isn't the Freedom Foundation. This isn't the Center for the American Experiment. This is MnDOT. MnDOT says, by their own numbers, February forecast 17, you can look it right up on the internet right now from your desk members, we will in aggregate increase the amount of money by over a billion dollars across those fiscal years. So when people say, we gotta have more roads and bridges, well guess what? The highway user distribution fund is increasing. And why is that? And we're not increasing the gas tax one single bit, Madam President, not one tiny bit to get to that number. Why is it? Because we other have other components that are becoming more and more uh, aggressive to the taxpayer's wallet, and that's MVEST, the Minnesota Vehicle Sales Tax, when you purchase a vehicle, as well as your tabs. So, Madam President, there's a lot of money coming in, and I appreciate Senator Newman's position in this, and I absolutely agree with him that we do need to use money from other sources. It is perfectly logical to do that. But to make the case that the world is coming to an end, that we don't have money, we just maybe don't have enough money for the folks at the front of the room that think we should. We can debate whether that's accurate or whether, whether that's the right way for Minnesota to go or not. But when you look at it and you have a billion dollars through fiscal 21 of fresh greenbacks, to spend on roads and bridges, and we have to spend it on roads and bridges, that's breathtaking. And that says we don't need to put another tax on the people of Minnesota that is so regressive that it's almost obscene. Thank you, Madam President. Final thoughts, Senator Carlson. I think we're real ready to vote on this. Oh, thank you, Madam President. And thank, thank you to everyone for all of your comments, especially uh, I really want to thank Senator Newman for his, uh, his very you know, interesting comments and also for his leadership on the Transportation Committee. Now, one of the things I need to be sure that we cover is some of the things that may be just uh, slightly spun or maybe uh, spoken just in a little bit different terms. When we talk about regressivity, the, uh, the people who have been in favor of gas taxes have also been in favor of uh, transit and you know what that does is it takes some of the uh, regressivity out of this whole problem and when we're talking about people living long distances away and the fuel taxes that they pay they are actually making a choice to live somewhere where they need to use roads and when you use roads you really need to pay for them so there is a problem there where we can't just provide free the people who, the roads to people who happen to drive a lot. And the, the example I was using was 20,000 miles, which is quite a few miles. Uh, anyone who is uh, just driving to work, unless they're into sales or something, they generally don't drive that much. Um, 
and it's, uh, it was um, $150 a year, not $200. It's uh, $1,250 a month, which is essentially maybe a, a latte once a week, something like that. So we really have to look down. It's really, it really is quite small. Now, if you hit a pothole, the chances are that you're going to have hundreds of dollars worth of alignment of, of uh, uh, your uh, suspension damage, things like that. And the American Council of Civil Engineers has said that that costs the uh, Minnesotans somewhere on the order, and they've, it's been plus or minus for over for several years, right around $400 per year. Now, we don't know how much of that is related to road damage that could be allayed by this, but it is a large number. It's a number that I would rather avoid if possible. Uh, I do want to talk about something that I heard when I first ran for office. I went to my first Chamber of Commerce meeting in Egan, and there's one of my acquaintances there who is quite conservative. He used to be a um, Dakota County Commissioner. He used to be a, a uh, upper management person in Central Harvest States. Uh, and he's, he came right, right up to my nose and said, Carlson, what are you going to do about transportation? Now I said, I really don't know what you mean. He said, are you going to use the money that was set aside to be put onto roads and bridges? And I said, what do you mean? Well, you, you guys, now he was, I wasn't in office, but of course we always get talked about as you guys. You guys raised the... Uh, the sales taxes on automobiles, because we never used to have to pay sales taxes on used automobiles. We didn't have to pay a lot of other taxes as well, but we added those taxes, and they went into the general fund. And he practically came apart. He was so angry that the legislature passed those taxes and never devoted them to roads. Now, a few years later, we actually did do that. We had a constitutional amendment to devote the sales taxes on new cars, and some of the sales taxes get split for transit as well. But now we have a constitutional way of dedicating those taxes to our roads and bridges, and only to our roads and bridges, when they go into those funds. And that's why I think that, again, the fuel taxes are you know, there may be other places to get these funds, but prior legislatures have never been able to do it. They've shut down the state. They've borrowed from schools. They've pawned off a tobacco settlement, all sorts of things to balance the budget for these other things that we have to pay for. Roads are important. Roads fund our economy. In my district, I have DART, a major trucking company. I have UPS and I have FedEx and they have all told me and DART is on the record of favoring fuel taxes. They want fuel taxes and you know why. Senator Osmick mentioned that this is going to get more expensive. They look at it a different way. If you go to Egan and you get on to 494 or 35W at the right time, you'll see UPS trucks backed up in traffic. This is money. The meter is running on them. They can't get things delivered in time. DART wants to make sure that their trucks are not stuck in traffic because their load is important to get to the destination. Their driver's meter is running. Everything costs them money while they're stuck in traffic. And they see fuel taxes as a way to help get this, this kind of congestion uh, re alleviated. Um, I think uh, another thing that uh, Senator France brought up that I really haven't mentioned before, and that's something that I learned from a friend of mine who was actually a city manager, and he said that, uh, you know, what we need to do is, you know, that when we talk about taxes on clothing, for instance, one of the big things that is a clothing tax benefit is you export your taxes. If we have greater taxes on our fuel, and we have people coming up to the Mall of America and they buy fuel and they get out of state as soon as they, you know, they leave there and, and go to the borders. That's exporting our taxes to people who leave the state. They don't require as much road as they do 
paying, uh, that they pay for our gas taxes. And that's another thing that we need to contemplate is how do we export some of those taxes? And that, I think, is an important thing to think about uh, when we're looking at uh, how we get to our, our major entertainment centers in, uh, in Minnesota here. Now, I really like this conversation that we've had. Um, and I think that, I think we've exchanged a lot of thoughts. It's very important that we do do this. And I appreciate Senator Newman's attention to this. And with that, Madam President, I withdraw my motion. Withdraw my amendment. The A-72 amendment has been withdrawn. We have before us the A-70. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, to this issue of uh, you know, making use of, of, of general fund and the reason why we think um, doing a constitutionally dedicated source um, is, is the better policy uh, because of the uh, lack of, of sustained reliability over a period of time uh, when we're just simply taking from the general fund and we're not actually using a constitutionally dedicated source like the gas tax, um, as is in my A70. This is not uh, a speculation, uh, Madam President, members. Um, in 2000, uh, in the tax bill, uh, caps were instituted on the vehicle registration taxes. Um, this was, of course, uh, an initiative of Governor Ventura. And uh, that created a, a deficit, a hole in the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund, which was filled with $311.5 million in transfers from the general fund over, uh, to be done over the course of two years. Uh, in, uh, in the uh, immediate subsequent special session, 2001, um, that, uh, that scheduled transfer was reduced. Uh, and uh, also uh, going back to 2000, about $282.5 million from the general fund was devoted to the uh, state road construction in the, in the trunk highway fund. Uh, and any, any portion unspent by the end of 2003 was to cancel to the trunk, uh, to the trunk highway fund. And then, of course, in a subsequent special session, um, uh, those uh, sources were taken out um, and returned uh, to the general fund. Um, so, uh, Madam President, we're not just simply uh, making it up uh, when we articulate our concerns about um, this approach. And Senator Newman uh, and, and the committee have had uh, many, many discussions about this. Um, but with that, Madam President, I'd like to withdraw the, uh, the A-70. The A-70 amendment has been withdrawn. Further discussion on Senate File 1060, Senate, Senator Dibble? Uh, Madam President, may I offer the A7, excuse me, the uh, A73. Senator Dibble offers the A73 yes. amendment. Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Dibble moves to amend Senate File number 1060 as follows, page 10, 12, line 29, delete. This is the A73 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Dibble. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, um, the A73 um, would uh, bring our metropolitan area up uh, in, in line with uh, most of the other metropolitan areas uh, around the country uh, and allow us to uh, raise and spend a, a full one penny for uh, transit purposes uh, uh, in the metropolitan area. Uh, Madam President, it would have the, uh, the benefit uh, to members of the chamber. Everyone should support this because it would allow the metropolitan area to raise and pay for um, all of the transit needs, both capital and operating, whether you're talking about uh, bus service, artillery bus rapid transit, highway bus rapid transit, or, or, or rail transit. Um, and uh, it puts a, right now at the, at the quarter cent that we do in just five of the seven uh, metropolitan counties, uh, we, we pretty much programmed all those dollars and we're coming to the, uh, to the end of, of the use of, those, of, of much of those dollars. A lot of them are being programmed for the operation in the capital. Uh, and, uh, Madam President, of course, we know that there's nothing in this bill. In fact, this bill exacerbates the deficit um, that is presented just to the regular local bus service. Um, this would allow us to pay for the local bus service as well as uh, do the more express types of service um, that we need. Madam President, not one nickel goes to transit either in the metropolitan area or greater Minnesota. This means that people won't be able to get to jobs. Seniors will be forced to move to uh, other settings before they need to. People with disabilities will be trapped in their homes. Students won't be able to go to school. 
Met, like I said, Metro Transit faces a $65 million deficit in the coming biennium. $24 million of that is attributable to Metro Mobility, but Metro Mobility, of course, needs to be kept whole, um, both for reasons of principle and because, of course, we value the ability, uh, the things that Metro Mobility does and gives people the ability um, who are disabled and senior to get to where they, they need to go, but also for legal reasons. Uh, it's an ADA-mandated uh, service, and once you establish a level of service, you can't um, you can't shrink and reduce that. So the entire brunt uh, of the lack of support and the failure to support uh, transit in the metropolitan area has to be borne by our local bus service. And of course, we don't make any gains in terms of uh, um, the kinds of investments that we need to make in the metropolitan area to build out a transitway system that would allow people to have the more efficient uh, connections to jobs and other opportunities in the job-rich areas, the people who are, who are isolated by, from decent transit who are isolated and don't have the 20 to half hour uh, commute to the jobs in the job rich areas of the metro area, keeping them locked in, in low income jobs and locked in, in uh, lack of access to the, the middle class. Metro Transit provides 90 million rides per year. We're at an all time ridership high with a number of years of sustained growth. This bill means that the metro transit system, the local bus service, will need to be cut by approaching one-fifth, 20 percent, with fare increases. So for the honor of paying more, an 11th fare increase in the last number of years, uh, we get reduced service. 18 million rides per year gone. So what do we say to the senior citizen who otherwise would have been able to stay in her home but now is forced out of her community and away from the neighbor she knows into a senior living center because she can't get to what she needs to stay independent? What about the student who's working a part-time minimum wage job at all hours, going to the community college, raising kids at home, and suddenly they have to choose between one of those three, and, and their opportunities are cut off significantly? Uh, Madam President, members, um, I find this aspect of the bill um, just extremely hard to swallow. Frankly, I find it uh, disrespectful to people we all claim to care about. I find it heartless, uh, and Madam President, it makes me think that this is not a serious offering in terms of a bill because it leaves so many thousands upon thousands of Minnesotans completely out, turns our back on them, and tells them they don't matter. They don't even qualify for any consideration in a, in a transportation bill because their lives are less important because what they need to do and where they need to go simply isn't uh, nearly as important. Madam President, we have to have support for transit if we're going to have a proposal, a transportation proposal that is actually going to be worthy of our support in serving the constituents we all say we care about. To the amendment, Senator Newman. Uh, first of all, Madam President, I request a roll call vote. Roll call has been requested, a roll call granted. To the amendment, Senator Newman. Madam President, the, the, the first comment that I want to make is, is that uh, uh, I have never uh, intended in any way to be disrespectful to anyone uh, when it comes to uh, this transportation omnibus bill. And I, and I want to be very clear and very plain about that. Uh, I, take, I take this uh, job very seriously. And uh, uh, I simply have never intended to be disrespectful to anyone. Uh, insofar as uh, the gas tax it's, itself is concerned, or I'm sorry, the sales tax itself is concerned. Uh, would Senator Dibble yield for a question? Senator Dibble will yield. Senator Newman. Madam President, Senator Dibble, uh, is there contained in your A73 amendment uh, a referendum allowing the people of the uh, counties that are affected either individually or collectively to vote on whether or not they wish to uh, uh, accept this tax increase. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Senator Newman, um, I, I appreciate the question, and, um, and the answer to your question is no, uh, there is not a referendum, um, uh, but uh, certainly uh, worth having a discussion um, if it would gain your support for this amendment. Senator Newman. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you, Senator Dibble, for your answer. Uh, members, I'll oppose the amendment for two reasons. Number one, it's a gas, or it's not gas, uh, it is a tax increase. I've already uh, indicated uh, that uh, 
and, I, and I've, I've indicated why I am opposed to the increases in the taxes. I'm simply not going to reiterate all of the reasons again, uh, just note it for the future. Uh, secondly, um, if the folks in uh, the uh, seven county metro area want to impose a tax on themselves, perhaps that is something that is worthwhile and has merit to discuss. But that is absent in the bill, and uh, uh, for that reason also, I will oppose the, the, uh, the amendment. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Osmick. Thank you, Madam President. Point of parliamentary inquiry. State your point. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Senator Dibble's amendment uh, references uh, state statute 297A.992. And I'm looking through the title of this bill, and I would appreciate the secretary and yourself uh, checking it myself to see if that reference to state statute is described in the title of the bill. Senator Osmick, I, I'm, I'm not understanding it. You want me to confirm that this is not referenced in the, um, in the title of the bill? Madam President, I'm approaching a point of order on germaneness, or I'm sorry, point of order uh, under our rules regarding uh, germaneness. There is nothing, this is substantially different. There is no, sorry. I was going to say then, Senator Osmick, you should state your point, and then you can offer advice by saying it's not in there. But at this point, I just need to need the reference that you're um, making your point of order under. Sorry, Madam President. Uh, I just didn't want to make point of order unless I confirmed it, because I wasn't quite sure I read through it, and I looked through it, and I couldn't find it. So, uh, Madam President, I would uh, raise a point of order. And that point of order is regards to Section 35 of the Senate Rules. Uh, Senator Dibble is referencing a section of statute that is cl clearly not within the title of the bill. This substantially increases the scope of the bill and therefore should be ruled out of order. Advice. Um, thank you. Senator uh, Dibble. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, uh, Madam President. Um, I would argue that uh, this amendment is, is absolutely germane. This is, this is the uh, comprehensive transportation uh, finance bill um, and the only one that is going to be in front of, of this body um, uh, this year. Um, uh, of course, it uh, speaks to uh, uh, transit and transportation modes of all kinds, whether those are roads, uh, ports, uh, greater Minnesota transit, um, uh, bicycle, etc., and so I, I think it uh, kind of stretches uh, credulity to say it substantially expands the scope of the bill. It's about um, a, a comprehensive package of, of forms of transportation. Um, I don't think uh, finding refuge in, in chapter citations is sufficient to find a, a, an amendment out of order. I think it's a, around it's about the thrust and the intent and the scope and the purpose of the larger bill. This is the omnibus transportation, finance, and of course, there's a tremendous amount of policy um, of, all court, of all sorts, including a policy that Senator Osmick has even offered to this omnibus bill that deals directly with, with transit um, uh, back in the policy section. So, Madam President, uh, this amendment is in order. Senator Osmick, advice. Thank you, Madam President. Well, Senator Dibble, I, I guess I can't really agree with you. We're not dealing with any local uh, sales tax is in here. We're not dealing with any place that I can find within this bill, hence I was asking the question, where we were in the bill amending or providing any clarification or any kind of language or any funding or anything to do with 297A strike or dot 992. Um, it significantly increases uh, the, uh, the bill itself, the scope of the bill, it's not in the original, uh, so I would recommend that this is certainly out of order.
Advice Senator Simonson. Thank you, Madam President. And as you consider uh, the point of order, I, I know you're considering and have heard advice under uh, 35.1, 35.2, but I would also refer you uh, to Section 402 of Masons, which talks about amendments must be germane, and I will specifically point out Item 2 and Item 3. Item 2 says, to determine whether an amendment is germane, the question to be answered is whether the amendment is relevant, appropriate, and in a natural and logical sequence to the subject matter of the original proposal. And I would argue that it is. Uh, and also under item three, to be germane, the amendment is required only to relate to the same subject. And I would again argue that it is. And I would concur that this obviously is an omnibus transportation bill and a trans transportation related subject is certainly germane. Additional advice, Senator Dibble. Um, aside from the uh, brilliant arguments of Senator Simonson, I'd also draw your attention to uh, line 12.29, uh, section three, um, uh, which makes uh, appropriations to the Metropolitan Council for uh, the purposes of transit, transit operations. I'm going to rule the point of order by Senator Osmick is not well taken and the amendment is in order. We have before us the A73. Thank you. Sorry, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, President and members. Uh, I would just uh, call your attention to, uh, to some of the handouts because um, I know we don't pay attention to the handouts unless we call attention to them and we don't want to waste paper. Um, and uh, one of them in particular is, on, is really nice and it's full color. Um, and it uh, actually is, uh, is, uh, repre is, represents in, in, in graphical form some really crucial information that we need to uh, bear in mind. Um, we talked about the population increase uh, that we're expecting uh, in Minnesota, 800, approaching 800,000 people by, by 2040. Uh, most of those, of course, will end up in the metropolitan area. And uh, a corresponding number of jobs, I think, that approaches in the neighborhood of 500,000 jobs, uh, members. Um, we have, there is, there's no way with the existing transportation infrastructure, whether we're talking transit or roads, um, that, that, that we have enough capacity to, to withstand that kind of pressure. Even if we wanted to build enough roads uh, to withstand that kind of pressure, we wouldn't have enough money to do so, and we certainly wouldn't have enough money to keep that, that number of roads up. Um, we know that, um, so transit is going to have to be a part of the mix, uh, and this bill provides nothing for transit, causes the transit system to shrink, the existing transit system, and become more expensive to utilize in terms of fares. We know that uh, our fastest growing population are senior citizens. 65 and older, and we know that senior citizens are remaining uh, more healthy for longer in their lives, and they absolutely want to be a part of our community, be, remain active, uh, remain a part of our economy, contribute in the, in the ways they can, stay in their homes, stay in their neighborhoods, continue to go to their churches and other places of worship, uh, and, and they, they won't be able to do that with decreasing mobility and lack of, of access, whether we're, we're building the kind of communities that are supported by transit, bike and, and walk opportunities, um, or uh, whether we're providing them with uh, alternatives uh, to driving. Um, we know um, that um, we have already um, the proof uh, from the Center for Transportation Studies that disadvantaged job seekers in Minneapolis and St. Paul lack access to where the jobs are being provided. And we know that we have a shortage in the uh, filling jobs, a lot of the jobs um, in our metropolitan area are going unfilled. If you look at um, the back of the packet that has the University of Minnesota logo on it that talks about the study that show, talks about the mismatch we have between uh, low-income folks and their access to well-paying jobs in the metropolitan area that could be addressed by transit. Um, the paradox of that is if you look at um, the, uh, the research uh, by our own uh, economic development agency, um, we have a, a large number of jobs that are going uh, unfilled. Uh, jobs for nurses, social assistants, other healthcare staff uh, make up about 23% of the open positions 
um, and, and many, many of those are simply going unfilled, and that's going to have the effect of actually paradoxically slowing our economy because we have people who need the jobs, who can't get to the jobs, the jobs remain open and unfilled, causing employers uh, to look elsewhere uh, to meet their workforce needs. And um, that could be addressed by the investments that we could make in, in transit. We know that, uh, and we hear repeatedly from our large corporations around the state and around the metropolitan area, Greater MSP, Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce, Twin West, Downtown Business Council, um, that, that they are desperate to attract uh, the millennials, to keep the millennials. Uh, millennials tell us time and time again what they want are metropolitan areas that are vital, that are vibrant, that have transportation options, that have the, the kind of neighborhoods that they like to live in, uh, and that's available through uh, different kinds of public infrastructure, transportation investments, biking opportunities, walking opportunities, and different forms of transit. And so then I'll call your attention to our state demographer's report. It's called Minnesota on the Move, Migration Patterns and Implications. It's got the state of Minnesota represented by uh, various modes of transportation. On the flip side, the fifth bullet down, it says, while 21,000 young adults move to Minnesota each year to attend college or graduate school, even greater numbers of students, 29,000, leave the state each year. In fact, two-thirds of Minnesota's total annual domestic net loss is due to Minnesota students leaving for higher education and far fewer return in the post-college years, thus retaining more of our college-bound young adults at in-state institutions may be a key strategy to long-term population retention and labor force development. Um, so, uh, Madam President, uh, we have nothing to lose and everything to gain if we're to make these key investments in our metropolitan area in transit. We keep pace with, if you look again at the, at the uh, trifold, uh, and you look at the uh, transit investments, how we stack up, Seattle, Cleveland, San Jose, St. Louis, uh, San Diego, Kansas City, all spending uh, more out of their sales tax uh, than we are. Uh, many of those are the regions that are attracting and keeping the millennials and have the emerging economies and the emerging workforce of the future to point to uh, as their success. Uh, we know that senior citizens want options so that they can stay uh, part of our, of our communities. And uh, uh, Madam President, uh, we know that um, uh, this is the, the avenue up and out of, of poverty. We have the definitive research. Uh, you can look at the uh, Atlantic article, how America's failing public transportation increases inequality, and the key policy lever beyond many that we talk about in this chamber frequently is providing good public transportation so that folks can access the jobs at a relatively low cost in terms of expense and in terms of time so they can take care of their families, so they can take care of everything else they need, get to the good jobs, get home, take care of their family, uh, and, and get that toehold into the middle class and stay in the middle class. So I don't understand for the life of me why we're sitting here discussing a half-baked proposal that provides nothing, zero, not one cent for transit other than um, the appropriation that I referred to, um, which is simply uh, moving some money around um, and uh, nothing for Greater Minnesota Transit. Um, so, Madam President, um, you know, I, it, it's very, very hard to take this bill too seriously uh, when it simply turns its back on so many thousands of people and such a key and vital investment in our state, in our economy, and in our future. The secretary will take the roll on the A73 amendment. Sorry, John, did I go, did I go red too fast on that one? One penny, one thing for transit. Is this a taxi to walk your rest today? One cent, something or other.
Captain John? Which one is this, sir? All those senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 21 ayes and 46 nays, the amendment is not adopted. Senator Osmick. Thank you, Madam President. I move the A105 amendment. Senator Osmick has moved the A105 amendment, but the secretary will report the amendment. Senator Osmick moves to amend Senate file number 1060 as follows, page five, line 30, delete. This is the A105 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Osmick. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Carlson, you want a gas tax increase? Here's a dime cat tax increase. Increase. You can vote on it. Madam President, request a roll call vote. It's a roll call requested, roll call granted. Discussion to the amendment. Madam President, point of order. Senator Latz. Madam President, I think Senator Osmick needs to be reminded that comments should be directed through the president, not directly at any individual member. Thank you, Senator Latz. Further discussion on the A10, Senator Claussen. Thank you, Madam President. Could we ask Senator Osmick to explain his bill, please? Senator Osmick. Thank you, Madam President. I will direct my comments to you. This is a dime gas tax increase. That's it. Senator Benson. Madam President, are we under call? No. no. Madam President, I would like to impose a call on the Senate. Senate is under call. Senator Benson. Madam President, I move further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and Sergeant at Arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. And Senator, do you desire the call to be for the rest of this amendment, for the rest of the bill? For the amendment, Madam President. For the rest of the bill. On Senator Benson's motion, all in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The amendment is adopted. We have before us the, oh, I'm sorry. We are at the call of the Senate. Is Point of order, Madam President. Senator Latz. I'll, I'll wait until after the call of the Senate. We did, I just took it off. I just misspoke. I said adopt the amendment, but the, um, the call of the Senate is off. Uh, Mad, uh, Madam Senator President, Latz. I ask that the President rule this out of order under uh, Mason section 401 paragraph four. An amendment identical with one previously decided on the same bill is not in order. Senator Latz, could you give me the, cite, the citation again? You said. 402, I'm sorry. Uh, section 401, paragraph four. Senator Osmond. Thank you, Madam President. This is a dime increase. I believe the other amendments were either uh, percentages or 15 cents a gallon. Uh, this is a dime tax increase, certainly not the same as the previous amendment. And I believe, Madam President, we've seen this many times before on the Senate floor. And, Madam President, advice? Senator Benson, advice. Was the previous amendment acted upon? No. Senator Benson, they were both withdrawn. So then I believe the, the motion would be out of order, or the uh, point of order would be not well taken.
advice, Senator Latz. I'll withdraw my point of order. Thank you, Senator Latz. We have before us the A105, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, I, I will assume, um, I don't know, maybe I was uh, just so phenomenally persuasive that Senator Osmick uh, felt so moved that he's going to vote for his amendment. Um, but I'm guessing uh, my powers of persuasion uh, are not so advanced. Um, so um, I'm, I'm suspecting that uh, this is being offered um, uh, just for the purpose of, of, of gaining some votes, and, uh, and that's fine. Um, I, I understand that. Um, I myself uh, am, am on the record and, and will vote in favor of this because I think it's a, a brilliant idea, and I thank Senator Osmick for, for offering it. Um, but um, I will return to my uh, earlier comments. Um, I'm looking for a serious uh, debate, a serious discussion, um, uh, not uh, uh, a political discussion, and, 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 uh, and really looking at investing in the future of Minnesota, the future of our state, by making real and key investments uh, in our transportation. Um, and uh, I'll, I'm awaiting that comprehensive proposal and not some of this, some of this stuff. Senator Bach. Well, Madam President, I, uh, I was just moments ago up to the front desk and asked how many amendments were left. And I was told at the rate we're moving, we're going to be here 16 more hours. So it doesn't seem like uh, we should be extending the time any by dealing with this issue again. So, and uh, spending who knows how long on it. People feel strongly on both sides. Uh, so Madam Chair and members, maybe the easiest way to get rid of this, uh, Madam President, as I move uh, Amendment 105 be laid on the table. I'm being instructed from the desk that we don't lay amendments on the table. So I, you, we could also just, I could just take the role. If I seeing no more debate, Secretary will take the role on A105. All those senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 23 ayes and 43 nays, the amendment is not adopted. Further discussion, Senator Little. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I've listened to uh, probably a couple hundred speeches on omnibus bills in the, today and yesterday, and, I, and I've learned a thing about how to give a speech when you oppose a bill, and there's three essential elements when you're opposing the bill. First thing is you stand up and you say how great it was on your committee and how you enjoyed working with all your colleagues. So I want to say it was great to work on my committee and I enjoyed all the fun I had with my colleagues. Uh, the second thing you do is you, you pick out a, a member of two across the aisle and, and you talk about how they're, uh, they're your good friends. Uh, so I'd like to say it was a pleasure working with Senator Osmick. Him and I are on a curling team together. And uh, Senator Newman will be my best man at my wedding. So. Um, now, the third part on, in how to oppose an omnibus bill is you give an analogy. We've heard uh, some pig in a poke, a little house in the prairie. We've heard uh, tires off the wheel. Uh, but I would like to talk about the Pied Piper. And I think most people are familiar with the Pied Piper, but I want to go through the story. So there's this town. It has a rat problem. And no, I'm not referring to anybody here as a rat, so please do not get offended. But this town has a huge rat problem, and they're trying to figure out what to do. 
And the Pied Piper comes to the city and he says, I'll get rid of your rat problem. And uh, they say, well, that's great. That's great, Pied Piper. Uh, so they, they tell him, we're going uh, to use your services. So they use the services of the Pied Piper. Uh, but then they decide not to pay the Pied Piper. And the consequences are rather gruesome uh, for this tale. All 134 children, I believe, in this town get taken away by the Pied Piper because they didn't pay him. Um, and so I want you to think about what this story actually means. Uh, the rats in this story were not the problem. And the Pied Piper in this story was not the problem. The actual problem with the, was the town's unwillingness to deal with the problem directly and themselves. And so here we are again hiring the sweet music of the Pied Piper. And that commission music, the lyrics will contain things like, we're fine, we're okay, we have billions of dollars in new money. We're investing in roads, when actually there's a great deal of debt we're taking out. The lyrics in that song will include some studies, and we'll look at some things, and we'll talk about some things, but it doesn't have any real solutions. So here we are, hiring once again the Pied Piper. And as we all know, uh, the music doesn't last. And eventually, we have to pay the man. So uh, I urge uh, senators in this body to vote against this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Little. Senator Schoen. Thank you, Mr. President. I have the uh, A93 amendment. The clerk will report the A93 amendment. Secretary. Uh, Senator Schoen moves to amend Senate File 1060 as follows, page 43, after line 19. Insert this is the A93 amendment. Senator Schoen, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, uh, Senator Newman, uh, for working with me on this amendment. This, uh, relates to an issue in my district down in Hastings uh, where we've uh, tried to work with MnDOT on a speed limit issue on a small section of road in a highly populated area along Highway 316 that is still within the city limits area. And then, uh, Mr. President, I also do have uh, a short uh, verbal amendment uh, to the amendment uh, to get it in shape for uh, at the request of Senator Newman. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh Senator Schoen. Thank you, Mr. President. On line uh, 1.17, uh, just noting that uh, the report is made out of existing funds. Clerk will report the uh, oral amendment. Mr. President and, and uh, Senator Newman, uh, just adding on 1.17, clarifying that uh, after the period insert, uh, this report shall be made out of uh, from this report shall be made uh, within existing funds. The secretary will report the oral amendment. Schoen moves to amend the Schoen amendment, line 1.17, after the period after adjustments would read, this report shall be made within existing funds, period. Senator Schoen. That's it. Uh, Senator Newman. Mr. President, uh, Senator Schoen did talk to me about uh, this amendment, and uh, assuming the uh, oral amendment is accepted, then uh, I would accept the uh, A93 as a friendly amendment. Thank you, Senator Newman. Any other discussion on the, uh, on the uh, A93 amendment? Oh. Uh, the secretary has corrected me. Uh, any more discussion on the amendment to the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Now to the, amendment. Now to the uh, 
Uh, A93 amendment as amended. Is there any discussion on the A93 amendment? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? That motion carries. Uh, we have uh, Senator uh, Carlson. Yeah. As amended. Thank you, Mr. President. I have the uh, A56 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Carlson moves to amend Senate File 1060 as follows. Page 5, line 30, delete. This is the A56 amendment. Senator Carlson, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President and members, this um, amendment was originally drafted as the uh, Senate File 837. It was heard in the Transportation Committee. And what it does is it requires cell phones when driving in a car to be used in a hands-free manner. It does not prohibit cell phones from being used. It requires that they're used in a hands-free manner. And there's many ways to do that with uh, just voice controls or with earplugs or with, with uh, some other mechanism. Most cars that are sold today have the Bluetooth mechanism in them that you bring your cell phone into the car, it pairs with your phone, uh, with your car, and uh, you can speak to the, through the speaker, uh, which is part of the radio. And uh, most of us have a cell phone that can be used this way, with the possible exception of uh, Senator Cohen, I'm told, uh, because he still uses a flip phone. But otherwise, the rest of us have phones that have this ability to be used in the hands-free manner or with just vo voice controls. Members, this... Uh, this has been a problem. It, uh, the hands-free device uh, would be made a primary offense, just like texting. One of the problems that we have is that texting, and of course, we've, you know, we've made that illegal quite some time ago, but uh, texting is being done uh, while people are driving, and they're taking their mind off of the driving, they're looking down, they're looking in other places, and the, uh, when people see them or when law enforcement sees them, it's a little tough to be able to enforce that. And so they would prefer to even have this, this ability to see when people are using their phones uh, as, a, uh, as a distraction or holding it to their ear with one hand and only driving with another hand or maybe a knee in some cases. The proposal has been crafted in response to a growing body of evidence concerning the danger of distracted driving. It's becoming more and more clear that using a handheld device while driving increases the likelihood of having an, having an accident. The National Safety Council has found that in 2013, the use of a cell phone contributed to 26% of the nation's car accidents, more than one in four. In Minnesota, this is con the uh, distracted driving has caused or been the major contributor to 70 deaths last year. So it is a very serious situation. Uh, we have a lot of bipartisan support. And without mentioning names, we've had the, the other body take a look at this. And there has been a lot of uh, both uh, support on the bill, their bills and also support in their transportation committee. Now, um, we also have a lot of agencies that have been supporting this. And I'll try to be brief on that. Uh, probably the, uh, oh, let's see, let's, let's say Minnesotans for Safer Driving. They have, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, endorsed this. Uh, the American Heart Association. They say, according to most recent Minnesota crash statistics, pedestrian and bicycle crashes involving automobiles totaled 1,802 in 2015, where the driver of the automobile was determined to be at fault Inattention or distracted driving was the cause in 20.5% of pedestrian crashes and 19.5% of bicycle crashes. The uh, Trucking Association, Minnesota Trucking Association, they say our drivers see what takes place in the vehicles around them and the news is not good. Far too many drivers are preoccupied with operating their phones, shifting their focus from driving to their devices. And you, uh, you have copies of these memos and letters on your desks. The uh, Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association, 
On behalf of more than 300 police chiefs in our state, the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association, MCPA, supports House File, and they say 1180 House File, but it's Senate File 837, what we're talking about now, which are identical, a bill that would make enforcement of the existing law prohibiting texting while driving easier to enforce and could reduce the number of distracted driving crashes on our roads. The uh, multiple listing uh, North Star MLS uh, for realtors, they say in July 11, 2016, our friend and colleague Hubert Skeens Cady was stopped at a stoplight on his motorcycle on Highway 280. A distracted driver crashed into him from behind at a very high speed. Hugh died from his injuries a couple of weeks later on his 56th birthday. They, now they have uh, signed it here with Tom Flaherty, interim CEO of the North Star MLS, plus there's another 17 members of their staff that evidently knew Mr. Uh, Mr. Skeens Katie. Uh, finally, we have the governor of the state of Minnesota lends his support in it. He said there's been an 18 percent increase in distracted driving fatalities from 2014 to 2015. One in four involved distracted driving. One in five fatalities involved distracted driving. A distracted driving is now the fourth most common contributing factor in fatalities behind speed, impairment, and fatigue. Now what I want to also do is make sure that you hear some, something from the families too. Uh, a, a Ms. Julie Javier, 58, was killed by a distracted driver in 2009. Law enforcement estimated the driver had their eyes off the road for as long as nine seconds, driving 70 miles an hour. Joseph, T Joseph Tikalski, 79, New Prague school bus driver, struck and killed while retrieving his newspaper in 2015. Mr. Tikalski was wearing a reflective vest at the time. The driver was sentenced to community service, probation, and four days in jail. Mr. David Riggs, 20, of Oakdale, killed by a distracted driver in 2013 as he turned his scooter into his family's driveway. Four days later, after David's brother Matthew could return home from his second tour in Afghanistan, David died from his injuries. 750 people came to his funeral. And a side note on Mr. Riggs, his uh, credit union that he belonged to actually funded some public service announcements uh, earlier in the year. Mr. Philip Valley, 19, of Ostego, struck and killed by a distracted driver while running. He was a star track and cross country athlete at Monticello High School and South Dakota State University. Mr. Chuck Maurer, 54, and his daughter Cassie, 10, killed in a 2015 crash by a 17-year-old driver who was texting and using Facebook and sped through a red light. Chuck died in flight to the hospital and Cassie died 10 days later. These are serious, serious issues that, could, that are entirely avoidable. They're entirely avoidable by a different behavior behind the, world, the wheel. I've often said that I wish that I could tell people when I see them driving by me or weaving in front of me, please hang up and drive. Members, I'm hoping that uh, you will support this amendment and I appreciate your green vote. And I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. For the discussion President. on the A56, Senator Osmick. Thank you, Madam President. I'm batting 500 this week on Germanus. Let's see if I can improve my average, Madam President. I rise in a point of order under Senate Rules 35.2, paragraphs 1 and 2. Advice, Senator Osmick. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the sections of the Senator Carlson's amendment uh, references uh, our state statute 169.011, which is referenced in the bill on pages 22 and 23. Unfortunately for Senator Carlson, this references uh, statute language in, re in reference to bicycles, does not reference anything to do with driving, does not deal with anything to do with distracted driving, doesn't do anything with cars. So, uh, Madam President, that certainly is, uh, makes the, the amendment out of order. Also, Senator Carlson amends state statute 169.425 
which has absolutely no reference within uh, this amendment. So I would request that you rule the Carlson Amendment out of order. Madam President. Oh, further advice, Senator Dibble. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, um, this bill actually was uh, included in an earlier version um, uh, that had been uh, proposed by uh, Senator Newman, subsequently removed because it had been called to uh, another committee. Um, and so at one point it was a part of this package. I'd also argue that if you look in the policy section, um, just if you look at the sheer number of bills and, and how widely ranging there are, there are at least uh, 30 separate proposals, all uh, very, very different uh, from one another. Um, and so this would, what would be what we call the proverbial uh, Christmas tree of, of policy proposals uh, relating to transportation uh, in the omnibus uh, transportation finance and policy bill. Um, so it's, it's difficult to argue that anything that relates to transportation that might come into this bill, um, it would be uh, substantially expanding the scope of the bill because the bill is already so far ranging from one subject uh, to the next. Um, and I would also argue that uh, this, of course, has to do with um, uh, uh, operating a vehicle, uh, operating a vehicle safely, um, and, and public safety issues, and a number of the, uh, pr the proposals uh, uh, have to do with those very subjects. So I would. Uh, find that the Carlson Amendment is in order. Senator Pappas, advice? Madam President, it sounds like you're ready to rule, but I just wanted to uh, reinforce what Senator Dibble said, that in these um, omnibus bills that have multiple provisions, it's very difficult to find anything that isn't germane as long as it's related to transportation. I will rule the amendment is not germane under 35.2. Further discussion on Senate File 1060. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I would uh, offer the A69 amendment. Senator Dibble offers the A69 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Dibble moves to amend Senate File 1060 as follows. Page 49, delete section 4. This is the A69 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Dibble. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, so the, uh, the A69 amendment uh, would delete uh, section 4 on page 49. Um, uh, Madam President, this is a, uh, a study on uh, metro mobility. Um, uh, for the record, I, I support uh, this study and think it's a good idea and it's something we should do. As a matter of fact, I was going to draft my own bill to this effect, um, but then Senator Kiffmeyer um, had Senate File 1713. It came to uh, the Transportation Committee uh, and was heard and then referred to uh, the State Government Finance uh, and Policy and Elections uh, Committee um, where it, it wasn't heard. Nevertheless, it uh, showed up here in this, in this omnibus bill, not having had the benefit of meeting, meeting its policy deadline. Uh, in, in the uh, state government. Um, and for the same reason that Senator Carlson's bill was removed because it didn't meet its policy deadline in judiciary, I think we need to be treating the minority members and the majority members uh, with, a, with an even hand. On, and if these bills that have traveled through the process haven't made their deadlines uh, to the relevant committees, they're not, uh, shouldn't be the subject of inclusion uh, in these policy bills as a way to defeat as a favor uh, to the majority party and not do the same favor to members of the minority party. To the amendment, Senator Newman. Madam President, um, insofar as uh, Senator, Senator Dibble's argument about uh, Senator Carlson's bill, uh, after that bill was heard in our committee, uh, I did receive a request from the Judiciary Chair uh, wanting to see that bill. 
it seems, seems to me that uh, clearly the Judiciary Committee had jurisdiction over it, and uh, uh, I sent it to uh, the Judiciary Committee. With respect to the Metro Mobility Enhancement Task Force, uh, that is the subject of, of this uh, amendment, uh, I frankly don't remember uh, sending that to another committee. Perhaps we did. But we did, in fact, have a hearing on, uh, on this matter. And consequently, it is, I think, appropriately in our omnibus bill. And I would request that the, uh, the members not support uh, the A69 amendment. Further discussion on the A69, Senator Dibble? Thank you, Madam President. Um, uh, Madam President and members, uh, Chair Newman, um, the, uh, the documentation um, that tracks the, the progress of a bill um, shows clearly on our website that the Transportation Finance and Policy Committee uh, heard the bill on March 2nd. Uh, it was referred to uh, State Government Finance and Policy and Elections. Um, the committee report was made on the floor here on the 8th uh, of March. Um, I'll note for the record, um, this bill is Senator Kiffmeyer's bill. <laughs> Senator Kiffmeyer is the chair of the State Government Finance and Policy and Elections Committee. Um, and in fact, I uh, made an inquiry specifically about this subject of Senator Kiffmeyer uh, when we were going through the omnibus bill uh, in transportation, whether or not this provision had been heard. And I raised the exact point that I'm raising now, that Senator Carlson's bill had been taken out of the bill because it hadn't achieved its policy deadline. Um, so why then um, would we uh, be giving special favor uh, to a bill that hadn't met its policy deadline uh, to a member of the majority party, um, yet uh, the same favor wasn't seen uh, grant, uh, granted to um, uh, uh, our, our member. So, um, Madam President, I think it's a matter of principle. I think um, we follow the rules uh, in this body for a reason. We all abide by the rules. I had a late bill. Um, it was captured. Um, when the committee report was made and sent to rules, and uh, the rules committee um, heard uh, consideration of the matter um, and, uh, and waived the deadline, and, and now the bill is uh, to the floor. Um, and I didn't uh, complain because that's the process. Those are the rules. We all follow the rules, and we follow them uh, for a good reason, and I think we all need to abide by them. All in favor of the A69 amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. The amendment is not adopted. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'd like to offer the A91 amendment. Senator Anderson offers the A91 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Anderson, P moves to amend Senate file number 1060 as follows, page 19, line 24, strike. This is the A91 amendment. Senator Anderson. Madam President, the A91 amendment redistributes the allocation of the motor vehicle lease sales tax in a fair manner in, uh, to include Hennepin County and Ramsey County. We had a brief uh, uh, oral amendment the other day on taxes. Uh, I didn't uh, vote for that, but in this proposal, I believe this is a fair proposal. Hennepin County and Ramsey County residents contribute substantially to the total taxes raised from motor vehicle leases, but are currently excluded from receiving any of the important transportation funding. As CTIB dissolves and talk of transit taxes going from a, qu a quarter cent to a half cent, cities in my district, especially Plymouth, need help with road funding. Cities in my district face major fiscal disparities paying in more than we receive. The formula change allows Hennepin and Ramsey County into the formula allocation at 25% of their population keeping the remaining five counties in the seven-county metro area at 100% of population. Uh, members, you uh, may receive a spreadsheet being handed out here that has one side an allocation to what the bill is currently. On the other side would be the allocation to the A91 amendment. 
Madam President and members, I ask for your support on the A91 amendment to allow cities like Plymouth, Minnetonka, and Woodland to receive a fair return and help pay for our roads. Thank you. To the amendment, Senator Newman. Madam President, um, just for purposes of, of an explanation as to the practical effect of the, uh, the A91 amendment, uh, what, is, what is happening here is we're taking some money uh, that is uh, currently going to five of the collar uh, counties, and uh, uh, Hennepin County and Ramsey County will then share equally 25% uh, apiece in that sum of money. Uh, I, I can't tell you exactly uh, when this occurred, but as far back as 2008, the money that we are talking about uh, has been uh, distributed to the five collar counties, excluding Hennepin County and uh, Ramsey County. Uh, I did have some uh, a run prepared by uh, the transportation fiscal analyst uh, as to the effect or the practical effect of this uh, amendment. And I'm not going to name uh, individual senators' names, but I am going to identify the counties that are affected adversely by the A91 uh, amendment. And if there is a senator uh, involving Anoka County, Carver County, Dakota County, Scott County, or Washington County, each of those counties will receive less money under the A91 amendment than they will under the uh, Senate File uh, 1060 uh, bill. And what will happen is, um, in aggregate, those, those uh, five counties will lose uh, $6,504,000, or $504, I'm sorry, yeah, $6,504,000 uh, to Hennepin County, and uh, 2.8 to Ramsey County. And so I think that the, the thing that folks have got to take into consideration here is just exactly how much money the A91 amendment is going to cause uh, in terms of a loss to your respective counties. And uh, for that, or for those reasons, uh, Madam President, I do oppose the A91 amendment. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam President, and uh, I appreciate Senator Newman's comments, but this again, this is about fairness. And again, Hennepin County and Ramsey County residents contribute substantially to this fund. And I do believe that this is a situation that Hennepin County and Ramsey County, in a fair way, at 25% of population, should receive these funds. Thank you. Senator Debel. Thank you, uh, Madam President, uh, uh, Madam President, and members. Um, this is uh, similar to a proposal that I've uh, brought forward when I was chair uh, of the committee um, uh, in which we um, allowed uh, Hennepin and Ramsey County at a somewhat discounted rate, if you will, uh, not, uh, not counting their, the, the way this uh, motor vehicle lease tax is, is allocated uh, to the collar counties um, uh, for the purpose of supporting their county state aid highway roadway infrastructure is on the basis proportionally on population, fairly straightforward formula. And um, uh, it, uh, we had made a proposal in the past uh, to um, bring in Hennepin and Ramsey, Hennepin at a quarter, 25% of its population, Ramsey at 50% of its population. Um, but the key difference was that we were bringing all of the dollars uh, into uh, the motor vehicle lease test, the 32 million that's currently deposited in the general fund were being brought in for transportation purposes. Uh, that is being brought in under Senator Newman's proposal. However, that $32 million is going over to the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund um, and not coming in uh, to, to this pot of money that then would, would have been 
distributed evenly 50% to Greater Minnesota Transit, 50% to this uh, metro area, CASA. So as a, as a consequence, um, if you look uh, on the A91 amendment spreadsheet to Senator Newman's point, um, uh, and you look at uh, Anoka, Carver, Dakota, Scott, and Washington uh, in the uh, fiscal years uh, 2018, 19, 20, and 21, um, they would receive substantially less uh, than they do today. That wouldn't have occurred under the proposal that I made. Further, that package uh, also included significant increase to transit investments uh, and allowed for a portion of the additional sales tax in the metro to be flexed for roadway purposes, uh, as well as um, it added significantly to the highway user tax distribution fund, so the dollars that would flow to all of the counties in the state through the formula, the 29% that goes to CASA, uh, out of the highways or tax distribution fund also would have been uh, a boost and a benefit uh, to the five collar counties so they wouldn't have been left um, uh, in a deficit position. Um, this uh, proposal, uh, while I appreciate Senator Anderson's effort to um, correct and amend um, the, the vote that he took in the tax committee the other day, so I understand what he's trying to accomplish, uh, creates winners and losers. Uh, and Madam President, I just don't think that's the way we should be doing transportation, uh, allocating resources or doing transportation policy. It's never the principle that I upheld uh, as a transportation chair. Um, and even when um, uh, people have happily slit the throat of my community and, uh, and, and my constituents, um, I've never returned fire in kind because um, I think um, it's important to live up to a higher ideal and a higher proposal. We're invested in the success of, of everyone. A uh, little bit of historical context. The reason this even exists in the first place is because in 2008, uh, when we were pursuing a comprehensive transportation bill, uh, and we ended up getting scaled back significantly by the influence of the Chamber of Commerce and the then governor, and we had to scale back the proposal to literally a third of what the original proposal was. The proposal had been a full cent, and then it was knocked back to three quarters of a cent, and then a half cent uh, sales tax in the metropolitan area to raise approximately $200 million for transit and a little bit flex for roads uh, at the county's discretion. And then that was knocked to a quarter cent, so we're coming in at about $90 million, and we had to dedicate that entire proportion to transit purposes. Uh, therefore, the collar counties um, really wanted to continue to have a little bit extra dollars. We talked about the amount of pressure there is on the roadway in the metro area. We export so many of our CASA dollars to greater Minnesota, we can't even do for what we need for ourselves in the metro area, and it's much more expensive. Um, to fix the roads in the metro area, and we have way more of the traffic, so it seemed to make sense to take a little bit of the motor vehicle lease tax, dedicate it to uh, the, the CASA in the, in the metro area um, as a way of making up for the fact that those sales tax dollars that we would have raised on the original proposal wouldn't be available to flex for, for roadways. So even though, uh, Madam President, I'm a Hennepin County legislator, um, uh, I see that uh, this, just, this, this allows Hennepin County uh, to gain six and a half, growing to over seven million dollars per year. At the same time, I see my friends in Dakota losing two, three, three, and um, you know, going up to almost three and a half million dollars per year. Um, and so, Madam President, I won't support this proposal for those reasons. To that point, Senator Anderson, because I do have several other senators who did yep. want to speak. Senator Thank Anderson. you, Madam President, to that, to that point, and I uh, appreciate Senator Dibble's comments. Uh, that is the difference, and again, this is a fairness issue to me. Uh, 85 of the 87 counties pay into this, and Hennepin County and Ramsey County do not receive the money back uh, to help with roads in communities like mine. So I would, again, uh, ask for your support and uh, like to call for a roll call. Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. Senator Claussen. Thank you, Madam President. and. Uh, would Senator Anderson just stand for a question, please? Senator Anderson, will you yield? Senator Anderson will yield. Senator Claussen. Now my question is, was this ever drafted into a uh, bill proposal, and was this ever given a hearing? Senator Anderson. Uh, Madam President, Senator Claussen, no. Again, uh, this came up in tax committee the other day as we were reviewing the transportation bill. And after that uh, hearing, uh, I went and talked to some folks because I do believe this is something we need to address. Senator Claussen. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Well, this is a long-standing agreement. It goes back to 2008, and I appreciate Senator Dibble and Senator Newman's uh, comments. Uh, if you look at Dakota County, uh, 
Only about a third of the money collected in Dakota County actually stays in Dakota County. This is one of those greater good transportation um, funding mechanisms. Uh, in our area in Dakota County, we uh, received the red line, and there was a great deal of money that was spent to make that happen. We're looking at the 35W corridor uh, going south, and that will be also a project that will be supported through this funding. So this was a, a, an agreement back in 2008 that was worked on to make uh, um, our transportation system in the metro area more efficient. And I really uh, greatly oppose uh, the proposal um, as um, has been made by uh, Senator Anderson. So I would appreciate a no vote. Thank you. Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, I also want to express my appreciation to Senator Newman. We've had some good conversations about this very issue. And um, I appreciate that, that he is recognizing that given the situation that we are in right now, um, that there are no, uh, there are no fixes to this. Uh, I actually, in the past, have been supportive of trying to find a path to fix what does not, on its face, seem to make sense. But given the history of it and the way it came to be, um, until we increase the funding overall for transportation, um, we can't make this fix without causing real harm.